Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be back here with you and to have fellowship with my brethren here in St. Charles. It's always my joy to come over here because I came from a small church back in the Philippines, you know. So I love the small church. There is more closer relationship and fellowship. The message I would like to bring today is mentioned by three of the four gospel writers. It is a very common parable that Jesus gave. And everybody already, I'm beyond the question of a doubt, that we know the story, the story of the sower. But it is mentioned in the book of Matthew chapter 13. We can find that also in Mark chapter 4 and as well in Luke chapter 8. But I will just be dealing with only from the writings of Mark. And as the basis of my message, I will direct your attention to open your book, your Bible in Mark the fourth chapter. Mark the fourth chapter. But before I begin, I like to begin our study with a word of prayer. So let us pray. Our precious Father in heaven, we will open your word to a very familiar parable given by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, written by three of the four gospel writers, indicating to us of its great significance. Oh, with much care, we will try to explore it and understand as a message that you want to hear, that we want to hear from you today. Father, I pray that if my words will stray away from your word, I pray that thou will let each one of us to forget them. But if my words will be staying true to your word, Father, I pray that thou will help us to live accordingly to your teaching, that we may lift up your lovely name. We humbly ask this in Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. So as the basis of my message, I like to direct your attention in the book of Mark, the fourth chapter. And I will read beginning in verse 1 to 6 and continue to verse 16 and 17. I pick up only one of the parables of Jesus. We know that the parables of the sowing of the seed fell on the wayside. It fell on the stony part. It fell on the thorny and then good soil. Today, I will just limit my discussion to the stony part of the parable. So you have your Bibles. Will you please follow the reading of God's word? Verse 1 of chapter 4. And he began again to teach by the sea. Boy, I cannot. by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Verse 5, And some fell on a stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, and because it had no depth of earth, I like to continue that in verse 16, to continue about that stony 
portion of the soil. Let's read in verse uh, 16. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness. 17. And have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. We have given a great amount of emphasis to the fact that the very first two letters of the word gospel spell G and O, go. We cannot help to notice that fact that when we pronounce the word gospel, that the word preceding it says go. This is indeed scriptural and necessary because if the gospel of our Lord and Savior is received, it does one thing to us or to anyone. It sets us in motion. And my friends, this is very important Christian philosophy in life. Well, you know why? Because Jesus himself said, in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And if we search the New Testament, the four gospels in particular, we will find scores of references that Jesus is talking about go. He uses the word go. It is a very important and vital aspect of our spiritual commitment. But you know, my friends, while this matter of being in motion as a Christian is vital and important, it is also important to have a firm foundation. And I call this as staying power. As I read my Bible, I find that Jesus was very interested for us to have a stable foundation or staying power. For you see, many individuals are just like the flash of light that you see up in the sky during winter months. And as brilliantly they shine forth, they gradually disappear. What do you call that phenomenon? That's Borel, Aurora Borealis, isn't it? We have given a great deal of emphasis in this generation of ours to the necessity of building automobiles with a go power. And I'm sure you remember one time, it was a watchword during that day to put a tiger in your tank. You remember those days? And as we are feeling the gas, we remember, okay, sports car, put a tiger in the tank. But you know, I am kind of a little bit confused, or I should say wondering why we put too much emphasis on that automobile to have a go power, but not much on the staying power. You know why I said that? we can find a can of beer lying in the street, along the field or in the canal, and that beer can seems to be in good condition. But we buy a car costing us 30,000 and more, and it rust away just in three years. You know, I'm glad today, in spite of that, that we can find some commercial that they can give you a warranty for five years powertrain warranty. And when the warranty expires, they will add another 100,000 miles 
extended warranty. It looks good. It sounds good to be true, isn't it? Giving the automobiles what we call a stay in power or it seems to last forever. My friends, in a spiritual sense, as we read the New Testament or the Bible, we carefully cannot help but to be impressed with the fact that Jesus is really very interested for us to have a staying power or firm foundation. You remember the time when you're reading in John chapter 6, when Jesus was explaining to his followers that he was the bread of life that will give them life forever. And you know those followers, those fair, you know, weather followers cannot explain that, cannot understand that, how they can eat the flesh of the Lord and have eternal life. And so they began to go away. They began to leave. And so Jesus asks his disciples, the 12 disciples, in verse 67 of chapter 6, are you also going to leave? And that simple question wrap up that Jesus would like to have his disciples then and now, including us, to have a staying power or firm foundation in our Christian belief. The scripture that we have read today, my friends, tells us about Jesus' interest for us to have the staying power or firm foundation of our faith. As we read the parables that I have, as we hear the parable that I just read, I am referring back to verse 5. And so you have your Bible, pay, please pay attention in verse 5. And some fell on a stony ground where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. Let's continue in verse 16, where it says, And these are they likewise which are sown in the stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. So we continue in verse 17, that says they have no root in themselves. And so endure for a time afterward when affliction and persecution arise for the word's sake immediately they are offended. And in many translations, like for example in Filipino translate, Bible translation, it says there they sumuko or they give up. They give up. Some Bible translations say they stumble and fall away. Some Bible translation says they stop believing and they gave up. Oh, I would like to share with you what is the reason why they don't have firm foundation or staying power. I would like to share with you three important great truths from the message that we have just read, from the scripture that we have read. In the first place, they, have, they had no power, staying power or firm foundation because they had no depth, no deepness of soil. Now please notice again in verse 5. The second part of verse 5 says, because it had no depth of earth. Then when you follow in verse 17, the Bible says, speaking of these individuals, they have no root in themselves. So why, do they, why don't they have no firm foundation or no staying power? Because there is no depth or deepness of soil. What's the meaning of that? The shallowness of soil. Now, my friends, the fact that these individuals had no spiritual depth is illustrated by the way in which they accepted the word. 
Now again, notice verse 5. In the middle part of verse 5, it says, and immediately what happened? They sprang up. And when, then refer it back to verse 16. The Bible says, and when they had heard the word, what happened? Immediately they received it with gladness. Now what Jesus is talking about at this point, my friends, is the person's response to the word of God. And the word of God refers to the Lord Jesus, right? Purely on the basis of emotion. So some people will respond to the preaching on the basis of emotion, on the basis of the excitement of the moment, on the basis of the thrill and excitement of the moment, they will accept the word. Now, there is nothing wrong in accepting the word because of emotion, right? And anybody who will say that emotion is not, is to be rejected as part of religion is doing a tragic error or mistake because it is a relationship between the one who is giving the message and the one who is listening. And this time, the one who is giving the message is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that Jesus was described as a very simple poor man. And so many are captivated and can identify themselves with the Lord Jesus. But sometimes we hear also great preachers, extemporaneous, eloquent preacher, and we are captivated as well. But when emotion becomes the primary reason in accepting the gospel, it is always indicative of a shallow and surface experience. For you see, one time Jesus was speaking about the matter of accepting the gospel. We read that in Luke chapter 14, 26 to 28. Jesus said to the listeners, now listen, any man intending to build a tower will sit down first and count the cost. And for those who have accepted the message of the Seventh-day Adventists, have you ever, have we ever count the cost of accepting the word of God? In other words, we don't just start and build out a house or a tower or a tunnel because of emotion. He's saying that in receiving the word, we must put our mind into the matter of accepting it. In other words, we must ask ourselves, what is involved in accepting this message? What is involved in accepting the word of Jesus, the truth that the Bible is presented? If we accept that because of emotion, what will happen? Consequently, it's a temporary experience. When the applause dies down, when the, when the feelings subside, when the light goes off, they are gone. Aurora Borealis. So it is not nice to depend on emotion when we accept the word of God or the truth that we have listened to. Yes, my friends, no individual can maintain an emotional high all the time and still be considered normal. Oftentimes, an individual who makes their response only on the basis of emotion or feeling good will have an experience that will not last. We have to remember that. We are going to have an experience that will never last. There is no depth, no deepness of soil. Oh, Matthew equates that in his gospel. Remember, we find this parable also in the book of Matthew, 
So you have your Bibles. Will you please follow how Matthew expressed that parable? Matthew chapter 13, verse 19. You have your Bibles. So you Will you please follow that reading? Say amen if you have that. Matthew chapter 13, verse 19. The Bible says, And when one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the way of wayside. So in other words, if we accept the Bible truth without understanding it, just simply listening, it will be likened to those seeds that were snatched out by the bird, by the fowl of the earth. In other words, my friends, if we have no depth of earth or understanding to begin with, no root to hold on, we could wither away and be searched by deception by, and be scorched by deception by other teaching. Oh, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. Oftentimes, my, fa- my friends, we have observed that individuals who marry and stay married are individuals who did not say to begin with, oh, the moment I saw him or I saw her, I am passionately and madly in love. In that case, my friends, that is an emotion, right? It is the Hollywood kind of emotion. They easily get married. As easy they get married, marriage is terminated. If there is one thing in our mind that we have to put emphasis, let it be our consideration to the person whom we are going to settle down the rest of our lives. The irritants that I saw or she saw before, like, for example, my behavior, mannerism, will be the same then, today, and even tomorrow, or it can even be even more worse. Yes, my friends, what I'm simply saying is let us put our mind into relationship. We can ask God to turn down our vow, but to turn up our rational reasoning for accepting the truth or the decision that we make. Many people who accept Christ do so only on emotional basis and not really understanding the fundamental doctrines that the Lord teaches. And so having an experience of emotional high, oh, they are just like a beautiful river, one mile wide, but only a foot deep. And a saying can go that say, oh, too thick to drink, but too shallow to plow. I'm reminded, my friends, of Jonah. Remember Jonah? We can read that in Jonah chapter 4, 6 and 7. The Bible, God said that God gave Jonah a gourd to protect him from the burning heat of the sun. But we know what happened, right? Overnight, the gourd, the worm ate those leaves. And Jonah became dissatisfied and not happy about it. And he began to gripe. My friends, a lot of people are like that. An emotional response. Oh, when the excitement, when the thrill and the glamour are gone, the religion 
is gone as well. I hope not. No staying power, no firm foundation. The Gospel of Luke chapter 8. Now, remember I mentioned we can find this parable in Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. So you have your Bibles. Let us follow the reading of what Luke said. In Luke chapter 8, verse 6. You have your Bibles? Please follow the, the reading of God's Word. Say amen if you have it. This is the explanation of Luke. Verse 6, And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it, what happened? Withered away, because it lacked moisture. And what is the significance of that? Lack of moisture. Is it not that Jesus is supposed to be the giver of life? Because Jesus said, I am the water of life. That, will, that is springing up. That will give us everlasting life. So in other words, that is the input or the explanation given by Luke about the seed that fell upon a stony ground. I'd like to relate to you uh, an experience when we were traveling in Europe. My youngest brother, our youngest brother, did the, tra the driving most of the time. And as we were driving, uh, he asked me a question, what do you think is the difference between the road here in Europe and the road in America. And so I was thinking, and he pointed to me as we were passing through the tunnel. The tunnel sometimes will be five miles long, 10 miles, or sometimes 30 miles long. Just imagine that. Granite mountain, solid mountain making a tunnel. And it takes a lot of drilling apparatus. Sometimes you need to do some blasting and then you take out those heavy granite rocks and put it someplace else. So it shortened our trip by almost half a day just to go through the tunnel. What I'm simply trying to say, my friends, is that before we build anything, the house, the tunnel, we have to think about it and to count the costs. And in so doing, in building those tunnels, there will be a lot of motion and a lot of noise. Correct? A lot of motion and a lot of noise. Noise such as People will be asking why, as an Adventist, you are not doing this and that during the Sabbath day. People will be asking, why are you not drinking this and that when you became an Adventist? People will be asking, why are you not wearing this and that when you became an Adventist? People will say, why are you not associating with all your friends during a time like this on a Sabbath day? See, my friends, th there are many reasons that we are getting a hard time to respond if we don't have a clear understanding of the fundamental belief. You see, friends, the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit gets down into the inner part of our hearts, and was able to remove all those things that we don't understand, then and only then we can have a spiritual depth that can build our lives, how to live the Christian life and follow the way how Jesus wants us to live. Let's go to the second reason why they don't have a staying power or firm foundation. And this is because they don't have the discernment 
Notice the second part again of verse 17. Verse 17, so endure, but for a time, afterward, they don't have discernment about what constitutes the Christian life. No understanding of what is involved to live as a Christian seven-day Adventist. There is no afterward, they don't understand the afterward that comes. Not only the joy and acceleration and excitement, but notice what it says in verse 17. The Bible says persecution. You see? What is the Bible saying? The Bible is saying for our understanding that there comes a time somewhere in the course of Christian life when there is affliction and persecution or difficult times in our lives. Oh, personally, I can, we can relate experiences that we experienced when we became Seventh-day Adventists. Beyond doubt, many of us can relate that. But if we don't understand that, some people cannot hang on and they leave. They want to have an easy life. My friends, what the Bible is saying that those individuals in Jesus' time or even in our day failed to recognize the fact that Christian life was not all parade. It is not all fun. There will be some stress that we will encounter in our life. Jesus did not say, come, take up your house and follow me. But Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, come, Take up your what? Cross and follow me. We need to understand that. And if we don't understand, the tendency is we fade away. We go away and not believe. Or they thought that Christian life was special singing, fine pews, comfortable views and nice fellowship after the service. But when they got into life, they found that there will be some persecution if you live really the Christian life. They cannot cope with it. And so they turned loose. No firm foundation. No staying power. Oh, Apostle Paul told Timothy, you remember what Apostle Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Apostle Paul said to a young Christian, he said, Timothy, I want you to be a strong, to endure and be a strong soldier. Now a good soldier, we know, doesn't spend all the time in the parade ground. We know that. A good soldier has to pass through so much stress and training before going to war. There are some of us, some followers, they forgot that there was some hardness to be endured as part of life. And my friends, there are so many fair weather dress parade Christian who fail to recognize that is the price to be paid if we really and genuinely to be a Christian. Sometime today, I want you to meditate on Mark chapter 10. And you will read what disciple Peter said, Master, we have left everything and followed thee. Indicating that maybe he was asking Jesus, what shall we have then? But we know what Jesus replied, right? You can read that in Mark 10, verse 30. Jesus said, you will have houses and lands and brothers and sisters. What comes next? But it is with persecution. Oh yes, Jesus is said, Jesus said, you shall receive hundredfold now, but there is persecution before eternal life. Did we ever think about that? In the midst of all the acquisition promised by God, 
in the midst of all the tremendous promises of brothers and sisters or nice brethren, if we have problem in life, sometimes we need to call somebody. Become your, mom, become your brother, become your sister. Sometimes we need to call for help. But my friends, there will come a time, not only those good things, but there will be persecution. And we should recognize that. Let us remember what the Bible says in Romans 5.3. We need to remember the tremendous portion of God's word. Romans 5.3, I like to bring to your attention in Romans 5.3. When we try to endure what's going to happen. Romans 5.3, chapter 5, verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribula tribulation bring it or work at patience. You see, Apostle Paul wanted a young man, Timothy, and a young church, and all of us, to recognize the fact that tribulation, the pressure of life, was pain to them, pain to us, were not accidental. They were not designed to destroy or rip our faith, but to strengthen the life of faith, to give us firm foundation or staying power. Before I end, I'd like to discuss the three reasons, the third reason why many cannot have a firm foundation or staying power. It is because they have no determination. Read again verse 17 of Mark chapter 4, verse 17. And so they endured, but for a time, but when the pressure began to develop, they fall away and they are offended and they withered away. Now, my friends, you can examine all of life to check the secret of a person that became successful. And you will notice that there are so many factors that made a person successful. And one of them is determination. Because without determination, that person won't be able to succeed nicely. I'd like to tell you the story of Albert Einstein. Anybody recognize the name? Albert Einstein. He was known all over the world. But as a child, a young man, he was very slothful. You ask a question and he cannot answer immediately. He will think, he will pause, and before he speaks, maybe he will stutter and probably not sure what to say. And so the father, concerned about it, he was thinking that his son had some problem, abnormality. So he asked the church master, no, I should say the school master, maybe the advisor, the father of Einstein, name is Hermann, asked the headmaster and said, Sir, what should I suggest? What do you suggest for him to take in as his vocation? And you know the answer of this headmaster? He said, it wouldn't make any difference for his son is not going to succeed in anything. If you are the father of that child, what will be your feeling? You will feel devastated, right? But he was determined his son to go through. And he did. Because of the determina determination of the father, Albert Einstein became determined as well. 
And as the result, he was the one who invented the formula of M equals C, oh, E equals MC square. And that is the formula of the atomic bomb. Determination. You know, my friends, you may be experiencing some persecution in your life regarding our faith as an Adventist. You may be struggling in life because of temporal needs. You may be struggling in life because of physical problem. You may be struggling in life because of the persecution of your friends and even your own family or even within the church by those people who have not achieved yet the character of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do not make all those things to fall away. The Bible says, those who endure to the end, Mark chapter 13, verse 13, shall be saved. You know, my friends, I'd like to relay a very personal experience. After finishing my high school, 1961, in high school, somebody told my mother, oh, don't send Ghani to college anymore. He is just handicapped. Just let him just stay in the whole house. But my mother was determined. And it helped me, my friends, to keep working. If I did not, I won't be able to be here. Not that I am a successful or great man, but without that determination, I won't be able to achieve what I need to reach in life. Oh, I'd like to end this with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our wonderful Father in heaven, we thank thee for the message that you have given to us. We pray that you will increase more of our understanding of all the fundamental beliefs that we have accepted to make us properly and deeply rooted in your love. Oh, help us, Father, to have a daily connection with our loving Savior that we may have the continuous flow of the living water that lead us to everlasting life. Strengthen us, Father, our faith, our determination to endure whatever reverses or problems that we encounter in life, that we may be able to lift up always the name of our loving Savior while we are waiting for his return. We humbly ask this in Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen.